The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I am Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by two excellent co-hosts. Laura Nash. And Nate Heininger. And this week we're talking about Venba. Uh, Venba is a game that I've actually been looking forward to for a long time. I think I first saw it in one of the, like, I don't know, wholesome games showcases or one of these kinds of events, maybe more than a year ago. Uh, and just something about its, like, art was really attractive. Um, Venba is a cooking game, uh, but I think more than that, it's a narrative game. So it's really kind of a different spin on the cooking game genre if you've played things like, I don't know, Cooking Mama or even Cook Serve Delicious. Um, and it's I, it's also extremely short. So this was really right up our alley. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that we had a chance to play this game. Um, this is not normally something that I would say is a good thing, but I ended this game being both sad and hungry. And <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that's like exactly what this game is going for. And uh, it was delightful. I committed blasphemy by finishing this game and eating microwave Trader Joe's palate paneer and was like, oh, it's the closest I have in my apartment. <laughs> no joke. I had that literally the same thing the night before I played. And I was like, why? I should have saved it mm-hmm. for for this night when I actually played the game. Um, and there's some wonderful Indian food uh, restaurants here that I'm like, well, I know where I'm going the next like 20 times I go out to eat uh, because of this game. Yes. And specifically, this is uh, Tamil, um, which is cool because like the the game is specific enough to say it's not a chicken tiki masala. It's a different mm-hmm. uh, Indian cuisine. I think it's also Canadian. Uh, it's about Canada immigration. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think all of that specificity made me like this game so much more. I feel like it's Florence E for people who've played that game. I think that's a really good point of comparison. Like I, I was reminded a bit of Florence, partly because this is it's like it's a family story, it's a very personal story. It's really about these three specific characters and especially about the the mother, Venba, um, and her relationships with her family. And uh, the cooking is a, you know, obviously like it's a, it's a cool interactive thing that really teaches you something about the foods and really makes your mouth water. But it's also just a physical way to kind of show stages of this person's life. And it, it, it just brings you into the narrative in a mechanical way. But really, I think the focus here is on the story. Yeah, the cooking is definitely cooking as a sign of love. And I feel like by making you the cook, you get to invest in that physicality. And like when the meal is served, when someone likes it or doesn't, you have a very visceral reaction because you did the stirring. You mm-hmm. you slaved over the stove. I had to spin my joystick like 20 times for that meal. Come on, <laughs> sit down and eat it. Yeah, to give a little bit of background, so the uh, the story is about a uh, an immigrant family. You play as Venba, who is a uh, a woman from South India, um, who's moved to Canada with her husband uh, Pavalan, uh, and uh, they they initially seem to be having trouble, sort of you know making a home for themselves there. They feel isolated. They're kind of having a hard time building a li- life for themselves there, even considering moving back to India when they discover that they're pregnant and they decide to stay uh, in order to hopefully give a better life to their child. Um, and uh, the cooking comes into it, in, it, it's in about seven chapters. And in each chapter, uh, you cook a meal. And she's cooking in different ways. She's cooking for her husband. She's cooking for her little boy. She's, you know, uh, trying to reconstruct recipes that she, to, in order for herself, sort of to to feel reconnected to the place that she's left behind and the family that she's left behind. Um, you you've come to Canada. Venba has come to Canada with a book of recipes that are all handwritten recipes 
passed on to her by her mother. But for unknown reasons, almost all of the recipes or all the ones you interact with in the book are incomplete. So uh, words have been uh, smeared or ripped out. Um, the recipes are incomplete or or not. You know, you you can't you can't tell exactly what steps to take. And so you kind of have to do a little bit of experimentation trying to reconstruct these recipes from back home. Um, and that was a really cool, like you, you really, I think the thing that really stood out for me about the, the, the cooking mechanics here, apart from just the sort of physical element of them, and we could talk about some of the recipes and, you know, how you did them and stuff. It was all very interesting, but really, I think what, what was so interesting for me here was like, every time she's cooking, she's cooking for a reason. She's mm -hmm. cooking to, you know, she's, she's sick or tired and making, uh, making food for her husband. And it's, it's teaching you something about their relationship, you know, his unwillingness to, to work in the kitchen, but her caring for him. Um, she's cooking for her little boy, um, who only wants pizza, but she's trying to get him, uh, you know, involved in, uh, in the food that she knows and in the culture that, you know, that she loves. Um, every time she cooks, there's like a really important, um, story beat hinging on that meal. And that I think is just the coolest thing about this. Yeah. I was also surprised th at the actual game element of the cooking. Um, the fact that a lot of the recipes are obscured adds just a slight layer of like video gamey deduction, you know, like tiny little cooking puzzles. Not much, you know, it's it sh it's probably not going to stall anyone for too terribly long, but at least it's something that you have to interact with. You have to think about like how are, what order are these layered in? What, what ingredient goes in at what time you can use some of your own basic understanding of cooking, or there's hints in the game that will help you. Um, you know, you can trial and error, you'll get through it. But I was totally expecting when I fired this up that the cooking would be totally just, you know, uh, totally narrative and something that you don't actually have to be um, like engage in on any sort of thoughtful level above and beyond the story. But they are most of them tiny little puzzles. And I really liked that as well. I loved how the cooking uh, recipe book play off each other really affected the pacing of the game. So when you're sick, you have one of the and it's one of the first recipes, Italy's, it, it's a bit of a harder puzzle, or it might just feel that way because it's your first time doing it, but it works because Bimba's sick and it's a cognitive issue to make something just slightly different than the way you've done it before versus other times when they um, have you making something you've made a million times and you might not use the book or you're only looking at the book for special steps. Yeah, They use it in different ways throughout and I, I won't spoil all of them. The game's only an hour, an hour and a half, but it does evolve over time and I think that's really cool. <clears throat> yeah, I think the the player's involvement is supposed to in some ways mimic the attention it's requiring from the person who is cooking, mm -hmm. right? There's definitely a point in the game that it feels like the character that you're playing is completely out of it. And yeah. the cooking, what you're doing while cooking feels that way. And it's it's really uh, compelling. And I think um, it, it th in that way, it made me think of like unpacking, you know, a mm. game we've also covered on the show where doing a physical act can tell a story in a way that you weren't expecting it to be. Mm. That's another good connection. Yeah. I, I, um, I also don't want us to miss talking about the art, which is incredible. Like this mm -hmm. is a really beautiful game. Um, it's all this sort of hand drawn. I wasn't quite sure what to relate this art style to. It has this sort of, um, you know, picture book illustration kind of vibe to it. You know, it's got this sort of, you know, it's, it's 2d art, but it's it's very sort of detailed, lots of texture. There's not a single straight, just untextured line in this. It has a feeling of something that's like, uh, you know, uh, beautiful illustrations from a, you know, a, a children's book or something like that. Like a like little that. golden book. Like it's oh, a lot of yeah. concept art mm -hmm. um, feel to me. 
which I that, really like. Yeah, I could see that. It looked. It, I was like, this could be the the beautiful concept art pitch book for a you know larger animated film or something like that. But then when it comes to the food, uh, like that same style applies, and yet somehow gets really detailed about like um, ingredients and the sort of visual textures of them, and things look delicious while while not getting too detailed to the point where like little stuff like there's a, a bit where you cook a fish and the fish is just cartoony enough that like if you would be the sort of person who might get kind of ick from the images of cutting up a whole dead fish you know its eyes are just little circles it's not like gaping at you or anything it's <laughs> you know it's a it's a cartoon fish so it's it's writing this interesting line between like sort of verisimilitude with the cooking and just like slight cartooniness to everything um I thought it was interesting and I'm surprised that like, like there's a whole, there's a whole like um, almost, uh, almost cliche at this point about like studio Ghibli food, like how I was going to draw say. food that's like so yeah. be- beautiful and delicious. And this isn't that it's like, it's, it's a different art style, but it manages to do the same kind of like just making food on screen that is, that looks so delicious and mouthwatering, even though it's like not exactly realistic looking. Yeah, it was like pixel art adjacent, especially on some of those real zoom ins of the soup and like all the little bubbles that are, you know, popping mm. and whatnot. Like it, it definitely it does a good job of like, I know this is not what this really looks like, you know, this is but it's sure making me hungry and it looks it looks delicious and there's enough detail in it too that you make a ton of different dishes but often a lot of them have similar bases or similar um you know first several steps and it's still distinct enough to know the difference between the different spices that you're using or the different things that you're tossing in the in the crackling oil and when you sift things you can see the the pile you've sifted and then the extra little bits of Deatrice yeah. on the sides. Like there's a lot of little charm to it that I think is really cool. It's not like someone just grabbed a Photoshop brush and stuck some some pixels there. There's a lot of care. And I think the art is such a pleasure to interact with that even when you're like putting this, you're forgetting the bay leaf, which I forgot. Um, <laughs> like, because who cares about bay leaves? I, I, bay leaves right? are a conspiracy. I'm, oh my god, Laura! We are, we are, you know, two, two sides. Oh, we're, I, I'm so with you. I have this argument with my wife all the time, where I'm like, bay leaves. That's a. That's you. Know, who? What do they even taste like? It's you just put them in to take them out. What's the point? It doesn't make any sense. But apparently, apparently, we're both wrong. Apparently, we're both wrong. And I'm willing in this game. Um, to put aside my feelings about bay leaves and and go back and put them in um, <laughs> after the fact. But I'm, I'm happy because it feels great to pick up things. It feels great to move them around. Mm-hmm. I love seeing the dish come together. Mm-hmm. Um, you, ever, oh. uh, you ever accidentally take a bite out of the bay leaf? Forget to take it out? Oh, all the time. That's yeah. that's what bay leaves Tor- are for. They're, they're for forgetting to take it out of the chili or whatever and then ending yeah. up with leaf in your teeth. Yeah. Or the person you most want to impress with your food eats the bay gets leaf. the bay leaf yeah. Yeah. yeah i've seen by the way like in there's there's some web page where somebody had uh compiled like 50 screenshots of different negative reviews for chipotle where people had ended up with like um leaves bay leaves in their food and didn't know what a bay leaf was they were like oh <sighs> uh, so there's a there's a leaf in my food why are they just bringing things in from outside what is this <laughs> like <laughs> All these, and it's, it's just very funny. I think people, a lot of people just don't know about bay leaves. It was like the did, Yankee reviews after COVID. The candle doesn't smell like anything. <laughs> that's a that's a fascinating phenomenon. I think that's so interesting, you know. But everyone knows whenever you get Chipotle, you got to sift through it. You got to remove the bay leaves. You got to remove the human teeth. You've mm-hmm. got to remove the balled up aluminum. Like there's a standard process to uh, mm-hmm. to sifting through your Chipotle bowl. And now we're getting sued by Chipotle. Um, (laughs) I do want to say, I want to say another thing on art style is the care around the language. This is an art style plus the narrative is um, Mm -hmm. I praised Pentiment to the high heavens for this. So I must also (laughs) praise Venba for it, which is um, so when you're speaking different languages, treating the text slightly different, or when someone's speaking language poorly, affecting the way. Um, so Venba and her husband are speaking Tamil 
and her kid uh, is, especially when little, isn't as well versed. And so uh, depending on how well he's speaking, there's like stains on his yeah on the words which is lovely um it's a really compelling way to display that it took me a minute to even understand it but once i did like i really liked it because i think a lot of you know you maybe do the pentiment approach and make it like wiggly or something mm -hmm. to to imply that it wasn't pronounced uh pronounced appropriately but in this case they make it like dirty which this game is from it's not from the perspective of vinba but it is mm -hmm. vinba's story and so to vinba the like broken Tamil is like is bad, you know, it's, yeah. it's dirty. Right. And I, I, I found that it very interesting. The story is, um, I mean, obviously this is a, this is a 90 minute game. This is a single sitting kind of thing. You can kind of sit down and experience this like a film. So we're going to try to steer away from spoilers, but in general, what I do think that, and it's, it, and when we talk about spoilers, like this is mostly about emotional impact. I don't think it's something where, you know, knowing the broad strokes of the story is going to ruin anything for you. But that said, um, this is, you know, this is an immigrant story and it's, it's telling a specific story that I've certainly seen done before, but because I think it's a common experience. Um, but I think it's done extremely well here. The story of the sort of like the disconnect between immigrant parents, uh, and their, you know, their first generation children. Um, the children are, you know, uh, trying their best to uh to fit in it's very hard being a kid it's harder harder being a kid when you're you know when you when you feel different in ways that you know are and so there, there's this there's this story of like Kevin, the little kid um basically trying to distance himself from his parents and uh from his parents culture uh and trying to just you know be quote unquote normal um, and the, the different, the, um, the, the, the separation that, that opens up between him and his parents. And then later we see him as an adult trying to come to grips with that, a, uh, you know, it's something that I think a lot of people have to experience. And it's a, it's a really well told story, but it's also something that stood out to me was that it's not a story that we often see from the parents' perspective. We certainly see Kevin's perspective here, but I think we see more, of, of this from the perspective of his mother. And we don't, at least in, in the, the movies and TV and whatnot that I've seen that kind of touch on this kind of immigrant story and family story, I don't think I've seen them portray it from the mother's side in quite this way before. And I found it really moving. Um, it's, it, it's it's so hard for a parent to you know to to see their kid just trying to make it and be happy, but also feel that they're like moving away from them. And it's it's I I I, I, I don't know. I just I found it very moving, like much, maybe more so than I was expecting. Um, so it was uh, I, I highly recommend it for that reason. It's just it's a really really well told story like this. Even if you think like ah, I kind of kind of seen that story before, not this version of it. You have not. Yeah, I mean, everything everywhere at once has a bit of it, but it's that's such a unique story that it's a, I, there's space for plenty of them. And I think this also reminded me, if we're talking about like other media, of turning red a bit and like the reaction of people about like the specific story um, and the mother daughter mm -hmm. relationship in that was like a very specific, mm -hmm. like, I'm going to take these characteristics of you. Also, you were a kid once. Like, there's a lot of those kinds of things. But I think that also is, you know, it's a Pixar movie. It's told from the kid's perspective. Um, it's nice to see that parents are getting just as rich stories told about them. Um, and they they do the full um, the full life cycle. Also, this has my funny, like, the first choice you get to pick is, like, how are you feeling? And it's, like, tired, nauseous. And it's, like, she's pregnant. Oh, I know. <laughs> Molly, Immediately. Molly and I were pl – Molly played through the first half of this with me. And, yeah, we both were, like – She's pregnant, like mm -hmm. der doy, you know. Oh, you've been tired for a few days? Yeah, uh, it's obvious. Wait, guys, I've been tired for a few days. Oh, no, Reagan. <laughs> oh, no, Reagan. You can't fourth Reagan. kid. Not another. <laughs> the podcast can't survive. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I also, I think it's really interesting. Um, the The India to Canada immigration path, I don't think is something that you see a lot in media. I don't know. I don't want to speak. You know, I know we have a lot of global listeners, um, so I don't want to speak for everyone here, but I don't think it's commonly known that Canada is a is a very highly 
immigrated to country from India. And so there's a lot of people that have had maybe this sort of experience, this very specific to this story. In fact, I believe mm-hmm. the, the game development has the developers have some, you know, equal history to the to the story that they're telling. So I just thought it was really compelling. You know, you know, I don't feel like I've seen another game or even really any other piece of media that is talking about people who've integrated from immigrated from India to Canada. And so I like that just unique perspective. It's also very specifically of a time too. like the mm-hmm. they immigrated in the I think mid 80s or maybe early 80s. I'm not 100% sure on the timeline. It does have years in it. I've just forgotten what they were. Yeah, um, but it, it very much feels like it's of a time you can tell like by by the later parts of Venba's story, you know, the, the Tamil community has it, you know, has grown and there are more resources, more people. She's thinking about teaching in a Tamil school in Canada. Um, there's better options for her in terms of like just availability of ingredients, you know, being able to, to cook. That's a big thing. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see, um, that sort of arc, you know, things were, were a lot harder for those earlier immigrants yeah. uh, when they weren't coming in with sort of like a, a pre-made community. Yeah. I, uh, a, a big part of this story is about their difficulty finding work. And just yeah. like the life of an immigrant trying to find work in a different country, uh, no matter how smart, educated or experienced you may be, you just have these barriers that n- people that are native to the country don't tend to have to deal with. Uh, yeah. And they, they cram a lot into this 90 minute game uh, when it comes to like the experience of immigration. And it's also touched on like the economics of food of like the spices cost more and they and the idea that you cook at home rather than go out because it's mm-hmm. it's cheaper in some ways. Like all of that is is integrated into the story. Again, a dense it, for such a dense story, it ever feels like a slog. I really enjoyed it, despite how much emotional impact and how much like I learned about South Indian cooking. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot in this and it's also just delightful to play. Yeah, yeah, this made I, me want to go out and get a cookbook for like right? specifically this region because it's very, it's really, um, oh, it looks so delicious the whole time. Oh, uh, shout out to the sound design of the the sounds of oh, each yeah. part of mm. the cooking, like you hear the the hiss of the kettle and the the oil frying. Um, I heard that the I, when I was doing a little research, the sound designer um, made had to do all the recordings as they cooked the food because it's not like there's an existing library of what it sounds like to cook these meals. Yeah. And some of these things have like very specific cookware and things like the, I forget the name of the the dish that's cooked in sort of like a large metal vertical pipe packed in, in with all the, the ingredients sort of packed in in layers and yeah. things like that, or, or the idili um, pan or what have you and, and everything, lots of stuff cooked in like pressure cooker type cookers. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's all got these different little clangy sounds and different, you know, things just sound different. It doesn't sound like normal cooking. It's very, the sound, you're, it's a good call out because the sound design really does a lot to kind of bridge the gap between these, you know, nice illustrations and that mouth watering, like, oh, something is cooking. Well, plus the music on the radio. Well, mm-hmm. it was just bops. Yeah. yeah. They, I don't, uh, um, in their press release, they say the soundtrack is inspired by Indian musicals. It never like Venba never breaks out into song or anything, but it does like you, you get the sense of like, this is representative of her musical taste. This is the music she listens to while she's cooking. You know, you see her tune it in on the radio and what have you. I Um, love Indian music. There was this, there was a track in the, in the, uh, in this game that was like, Felt like a math rock core with Indian music <laughs> on top of it. It's like, yes, I did not know I needed this. Yeah, I wonder if I've, they've posted the soundtrack anywhere. I think it would be interesting to give it a listen, you know, separated from the cooking and everything. It, it is really cool sounding. Um, I'll also just, you know, I, I think there's not a whole lot else to say about Venba. It is 90 minutes and it is worth the 90 minutes. And especially, um, I played it on Game Pass because this is this is on Game Pass. It's on Xbox uh, if you have an Xbox and you can just play it on there. It's also on PC Game Pass. It launched on Game Pass, which was nice and convenient, you know, day one release on there. Um, and I love that for these little experiences because I know um, many, many more people will give this a shot and give you know, see this story through um, because it's more easily available. Of course, it's also on Steam. It's like fourteen ninety nine mm-hmm. on Steam. 
Um, and I expect it'll probably come to other platforms as well. I don't know if it is already. Um, let me see if they say on their website here. They do in Nintendo Switch. It is on Switch as well, and I assume it's probably fourteen ninety nine there too. Um, but uh, yeah, totally recommend this game. I I thought it was a beautiful story. It was moving. It uh, it was not what you expect when you sit down to play a cooking game, but the cooking was very compelling. Um, top to bottom, yeah. I thought this was great. I don't know that I would even call this necessarily a cooking game. I know that that's what it's branded as. That's how they pitch it. Yeah, I know, I know, but like. It's really it's a it's a beautiful narrative game with with a with a cooking element to it. You know, yeah. although well, cooking I'd say, is like, so integral to the story. So yeah. I, I think it's a food game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a story about like if, if this was uh, if this was a novel, it would be uh, what what? Sorry, I just realized I was going to make a point and then I forgot the word I was looking for. So I'll have to cut that. What's that <laughs> word like? There's a word for like a book that's like ha- like a half travelogue, half like food. Oh, thing. like uh, like what's his face's book? Um, oh my god, <laughs> the guy, all- uh, Anthony Bourdain's book, right? That is like a uh, half a a cookbook and half like his journey across the world learning about food. Do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, I don't know the word yeah. for that. I think yeah. there is a word for that. Oh, well, hmm. I'll cut this. <laughs> um, it's it, it just does a it, it, the cooking is just so integral to the way that it tells its story. It's, you know, cooking is so important to the main character for different reasons at different points in her life. Yeah. It's it's so uh, it's so ingrained that like, you know, when you say cooking game, like people just imagine one of like three games yeah right? and there's no yeah. time management aspect to this right this all. isn't you know you're not it's not a management sim it's not a it's not a you know uh visual you know mechanical toy like uh like a cooking mama it's not a cooking game in the sense that you would think of that um uh, shout out to cooks are delicious the best cooking game you should try that series those are very or good. i was hoping for a little chaos like overcooked overcooked, you know? yeah. overcooked. <laughs> none um, of that none well, of that here when i like cooking it feels like cooking in this game yeah I see that. there are many times i am cooking because it is a scam and you have to feed yourself multiple times a day ah dude eating is a scam <laughs> who made that um, rule, right yeah. <laughs> But but when I enjoy cooking and I do sometimes like sometimes it's it's a really joyful occurrence like it feels like the best parts of this game and I think that's a really cool thing to put in a video game. Totally. So do we have some time for what's making us happy this week? Nate, I saw a long sigh when I saw that. Nate, did <laughs> nothing make you happy this week? Well, no, I just you always all of you always have such interesting things to recommend such good uh, th- like alternate media and books and music. And my thing that's making me happy is that I went to the beach last week and I haven't been to a I haven't been to a legit beach like an oceanside beach in nine years so maybe eight years. So I went, me and the family, we went down to Florida, Gulf Coast, and spent a week on the beach. And it was wonderful. Uh, got a little sunburn. There were like a billion jellyfish, which was weird. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was still it was a great time. And so I guess what's making me happy is some fun in the sun. I haven't had a trip like that in a long time. So nice. not not sighing out of lack of happiness. Just uh, I just got like one thing that I've done, you know, in the last <laughs> two weeks or so. Well, we did a very awesome. scaled down version of that. We went to Coney Island on Sunday nice. uh, and I'd never been. And we rode the Cyclone, which is a 96 year old wooden roller coaster. Um, nice. Reagan will remember the Texas Cyclone at Astroworld, uh, yeah. which was R. the R. dupe of this. But I think this was. One's a little smaller and a little more intense. Are you a are you a roller coaster person? I love roller coasters. I am. Justin's not. We were going okay. to ride a roller coaster called the Thunderbolt because uh, I was with or his friend Garrick and we Garrick and I were in line to ride the Thunderbolt when somebody like they had people on not moving and had them get off and we were like let's get to another line because something's um yeah. that one you go straight up and then go over a little lip and then go straight down and there's yeah, a lot of loops and stuff they fixed it but we were at that point we had had two beers and we're like maybe mm, <laughs> don't go yeah. on this not a great mm, combo 
Um, but uh, we didn't go on the beach, but we looked at people on the beach because that is my sometimes beach that's activity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, beach is great for people watching. Yeah, smelling the sea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't been to a beach lately, uh, but I have been exploring uh, the Forgotten Lands or whatever they're called. The, uh, I've, been, I've been playing uh, Baldur's Gate 3 a little bit. <laughs> um, the, I, I've played exactly five ben, Venba's worth of, of Baldur's Gate. <laughs> And nice. um, I, I, you know, don't have many places to talk about long games here. Um, I haven't played enough. Five Venba's worth of, of Baldur's Gate is not that much of Baldur's Gate 3. Um, but I've gotten enough to get started and, and start enjoying myself. And I just wanted to say it's fun. It's a good game. If you, I think what's really, I've tried to play other games by Larian. They're really famous for these like really quite interesting um, like CRPGs, you know, sort of tactical like mostly top down um you know rpg type of games uh like divinity original sin and original sin 2 are both super super well regarded i played mm-hmm. a little bit of both of them i think mostly the first one i didn't play so much so much of uh, divinity original sin 2 but i kind of eventually bounced off of both of those and it was because they are complicated and the rules are kind of in depth and it really does expect you they're hard they do expect you to like really deeply engage with those systems and everything um and uh, this one, Baldur's Gate 3, same deal, but the rules are D&D rules. So all of the like crunchy stuff about like, you know, how how does uh, this, uh, you know, spell interact with this resistance or what can I do with this type of class of character and what have you, all of that actually is just drawing on experiences that I have over many years of playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, And of course, you know, things are a little different in a computer setting, but they've done an incredible job of just making D&D as a video game with like, like all the spells are there and like all the classes and you can multi-class and like also lots of weird stuff. Like you can, you know, romance a bear that kind of stuff like it's it's, Hell, it's very yeah it feels very like tabletoppy um you can play this thing co-op i'm really looking forward to giving that a try so far i've only been playing it solo but i rolled myself up a uh, a, a halfling rogue named pickles and she's been going on a great adventure and it's been awesome so far uh and um, i haven't played enough of it to like get into the real deep end of it but I'm I'm liking it a lot. So uh, that's probably my one RPG for this year. I've talked about this before. I can usually only ever really manage one big RPG in any given year. Uh, looks like it's this. Uh, enjoying it so far. Uh, it's scratching the The Witcher 3 itch for me. It's a very mm. different game. It's less of an action game. Uh, no action, really. It's more, you know, it's just turn-based or what have you. But but um, But it has that it has that feel of like, there's just so much game here. There's so much depth to it. The characters are interesting. You know, it's all fully voiced, which is really nice. And that's different from the previous Larian games I've tried that I bounced off of. I think that helps a lot for me to sort of getting immersed in it is like not, it's not a, an exercise in reading text boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm having a, a ton of fun with it. And we have a, a Baldur's Gate 3 channel on the Discord. So if you join, a, if you're playing Baldur's Gate and you want to chat with me about it, come do it. Hell yeah, um, always be plugging. Um, I am <laughs> I am incredibly excited about this game. Uh, Baldur's Gate 2 is a game that Molly and I played together all the way through very early on in our relationship. And I've been excited about Baldur's Gate 3 since it's been announced. I've avoided engaging in the early access stuff because I knew Same. I wanted to play this game. And so I'm just wanted to wait till it was launched. I am waiting for it to come out on PS5, which may hinder my ability to play with you well, all. I thought that I'm- was already out. I thought it was, I thought it did not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm completely disengaged from the. No. Um, I, I've only been playing on PC and Steam Deck, but it plays great on I haven't- both. I haven't looked at it uh, if there's been any updates, but last I saw it's coming out the same day as Starfield, which is terrible because I also want to play that game. Uh, And also, I'm still maybe a quarter of the way through Tears of the Kingdom. And I started, by the way. Oh, you have. Oh, we got to do a whole other episode about it. Um, And also, Molly and I are still we're at the end game of Nobody Saves the World, the current Mm -hmm. uh, couch co-op RPG that we're loving. Uh, so I suspect once we finally pick up Baldur's Gate 3, 
we're going to be playing this for the next three or four years. Uh, but oh, yeah. I'm I'm very, very excited about this game. I saw people in the Discord chatting about like trying to get their D&D campaign to to actually just r- convert into a Baldur's Gate group, <laughs> uh, which I think is a brilliant idea. I think that could so. actually legitimately work. It yeah. really feels like a like a like yeah. a tabletop thing in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I'm very, very excited about this game and I'm really uh, happy to see that it's been well regarded and uh yeah i'm I'm glad you're enjoying it so far yeah laura what's making you happy this week so um in contrast to the outdoor activity of like leaving a house and go to coding island um we've been very indoor people since we got back from vacation because well first of all it's either been incredibly hot incredibly rainy and humid or we've just wanted to stay at our house um we, besides playing uh, the aforementioned Tears of the Kingdom, um, we've been watching a lot of uh, Dropout.tv, which is a like a comedy network that's independent. Um, they are back in production because they're so independent, they're not affected by the writers or the SAG strike. <laughs> uh, they, d- they paused and checked with the unions and the unions were like, you have like you are we're not striking yeah. against you like you pay your people so you can feel good about um supporting them but uh if you're not ready to subscribe to a monthly like niche service which i was not and didn't for a while um you can watch a lot of their stuff on youtube and we've specifically i mean watched there's a show called game changer which i think i've talked about here before or at least on the discord where every episode the game shows a different format and the yes. people on the show have to figure out what the format is. Um, but what we've been watching this week, because we're feeling very nerdy and lazy, is a show called Um Actually, where the game is the host reads uh, facts about something and you buzz in and correct it. <laughs> Hmm. It's a game about nerd minutia where you have to identify exactly what's wrong with the sentence. And you nice. go, um, actually, uh, the Maltese Falcon wasn't real so technically they didn't sell the real melty's falcon at auction that kind of thing (laughs) Um, it's delightful and specifically the thing that uh justin saved for me to watch with me um was they did two um actually with musicals correction and the first one had rachel bloom and uh you know it's serious when rachel bloom is not winning the musical corrections wow. episode wow. because she's getting too distracted and like too angry to to remember the rule to say i'm actually at the start uh just it, you feel good when you get it right and you feel good when you don't know it because you feel like you didn't waste your life <laughs> on the minutia <laughs> like and that's a perfect game show where no matter what you feel better about yourself <laughs> at the end of the day <laughs> if you get it right you have the righteous anger of knowing it mm-hmm. um i specialize in picking out something that i'm like but that's also incorrect <laughs> like but really if you think about yeah. it like this thing <laughs> so i'm right with my correction <laughs> Is there any better feeling than righteous vindication? I I can't think of a single better thing in this world than that. No, and it's <laughs> and plus they're funny, like because it's comedians. So like even if no one is, everyone is shooting in the dark at what the correction is, it's still entertaining. Um, you'd be surprised how exciting a roundabout correcting minutia can be. <laughs> but, um, also, this has given me a real appetite for like which. Uh, properties I don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, for example, another thing they do is shiny questions, um, which are like special questions. One of them they did in the movie episode was called 21 jump Streep, which was Meryl Streep's been nominated for the Academy award 21 times. Which huh. ones did she actually win? <laughs> no idea. And they show all 21 and you just have to pick which three she actually won. Devil wears Prada. Nope. (laughs) 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 Should have. (laughs) Yeah, she was nominated for that, right? She was nominated. Yeah, that's on the list. All right, I got one. That kind of thing. We're like, I got one. I'll take it. (laughs) um, (laughs) Anyway, it's it's delightful and inventive, and um, we we had said when we get back, we're gonna like. We're yeah. turning like we turn on and off things. So like Netflix is paused and we're going to turn on dropout and then we're going to like tur- like we just rotate around. Mm-hmm. So um, I know they do a lot of like Dimension 20 real um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff, which I've never touched. But like we'll see if I get really into that. But 
I don't know. It's nice to have a comedy network. Yeah. That you're like, oh, wow. All of this is pretty good. <laughs> I I saw Barbie. There's a Meryl yeah. Streep connection. Yeah. Yeah. I was I, just I, listening to the Barbie soundtrack before we hopped on. It's, it's a really awesome. good soundtrack. It is mm-hmm. a great soundtrack. Yeah. The whole thing. I, I loved it. it I loved it. it. Awesome. I just figured everyone had talked about Barbie already. So. Oh, no, but, but this is the show where we're all late to culture 100% of the time. So I think yeah, it's okay. And, and also, hey, here we are. This is uh, this episode is coming in under par. So we can yeah. talk about Barbie if you want. <laughs> I'm already in the tank for Greta Gerwig. And I'm yeah. in the tank for Greta Gerwig continuing to make at least – triple her budget as she has since she started oh God. filming yeah incredible yeah. movie i loved it so much I, I i took myself out to it i think i mentioned i may have t- already talked about this on the show i forget i took myself out on a, on a little lunch date for myself uh to go see the barbie movie i went to a uh, a dine-in theater at 11 o'clock uh, nice. and i was the only person in the theater and uh <laughs> ate a mediocre burger for too much money but it was wonderful i had a great time so i loved it I've got a secondary uh, recommendation if you liked Barbie. Uh, Letterboxd did an interview with Greta Gerwig on the movies that inspired it, and it is mm. such an interesting conversation. She I is so stressed <laughs> trying to fit it in. She had like 30 things. She, she mentioned thir- she brought a list of 29 and said 33, but um, I, I think it was a, a tremendously interesting thing if you liked the production design. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had, had no idea what it was, so maybe maybe I'll add some of those to my list. I'll have to check that out. I had a very, uh, unfortunately, I think almost like perfect cliche experience while watching this film. Uh, you know, there's a very emotional uh, moment, a very climactic emotional moment where there's almost no sound and it's just, uh, you know, dialogue and it's very heavy. And this dude sitting next to me, I think it was maybe with a date, was literally going like, oh, this is so <laughs> boring. Like, oh my God, next to me when it's a like powerful speech about, you know, female empowerment. I'm like, oh, my God, guy, could you be more of a cliche right now during this exact moment in this movie? It was. There's been more than one article about women breaking up with their partners after Barbie. Yeah, well, if this was a date, I don't know. I'm like, uh, not a good look, dude. <laughs> like, come on. It's horrible. Yeah, lady, yeah. like, don't go home with that guy. Yeah, lady, get up and walk away. There's an empty seat to our right. Come and sit next to Molly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. You can find our show on the internet at shortgame.fm, uh, where there's all the links and buttons you could possibly need in your entire life. They go to all the things, our socials on Mastodon and elsewhere. Uh, you can find our Patreon there, patreon.com slash the short game. By the way, did you know that every one of our patrons gets access to our Discord community, which is where we talk about the show, plan future episodes, talk about episodes that have just come out. Uh, if you want to talk to us about Venba, if you want to talk to me about Baldur's Gate 3, uh, if you want to talk about Barbie, we're there, we hang out there, and we are happy to chat with you. Uh, and let's see, it's a good community, we like it. Um, you can also find me on Mastodon. I'm Reagan, that's R. A Y G A N at bird dot rodeo. Uh, and I'm on threads too, mostly lurking at Reagan, R A Y G A N. Uh, and uh, Nate, where can people find you? On Twitter still, although let me tell you, the walls are crumbling. No, you're not. You're on X. <laughs> yeah, don't. Yeah, there's. Yeah, well, at Nate STL. Um, I heard I heard the best description of the, the not to turn we always have lately I've been turning this section into the Twitter rebrand commentary corner and apologies but I had to share uh, somebody said that the X rebrand gave them dude wipes energy oh, <laughs> and I was like no. that's the most perfect explanation <sighs> have you guys seen that the dude yes. wipes yes uh, yeah them, I guess oh god um, <laughs> Laura where can people find you before I start I'm I'm kind of not on anything, but you can still find me there um, on X at Laura J Nash at uh, Bastadon Laura J Nash at Bird Rodeo. I'm not active either place, but if you ping me there, I'll answer. Yeah, and listeners, thank you once again for joining us on this episode of the Short Game. <laughs>